Breath of Fire 3. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait to talk about this game. Let's just, let's just get right into it, all right? Breath of Fire 3, here we go. Alright, so my original plan was to do a big, long, retrospective series on the Breath of Fire games, giving them each a video. But then I started playing through the SNES ones again, and I had this light bulb moment where I realized, I'm bored. Let me walk you through my mind when deciding to do these videos. I was watching YouTube and a Breath of Fire 4 speedrun popped up, and I started watching it, and I was all, man, I love these games, I should totally do a video on those. But that means I'll have to do the first two. Ah, well, it can't be that bad. And it wasn't bad, it just wasn't fun. Let me tell you, I first played Breath of Fire 2 when I was a little kid and I rented it from Blockbuster. I had it for a week and all I remember from the experience was not liking it. And it wasn't like I hated RPGs, I mean Pokemon Red was out and I was glued to that game. Breath of Fire 2 just didn't do it for me. There was a lot going wrong with it, but I distinctly remember being disappointed in the dragons. The game gives you this badass ability to summon dragons, at least I thought that's what was happening when I was 8, but it drains all your magic so you can only do it once? That's dumb. So yeah, you could probably argue my opinion of the game is long poisoned. But then a couple years later, I was at a friend's house and he pops in this game called Breath of Fire 3. Mind you, I had totally forgotten about 2 by this time. This game, on the other hand, blew my goddamn mind. You got this awesome looking world and map to explore, battles didn't take me to some stupid screen, they let me fight it out right there, and your character turned into a motherfucking dragon. This was cool from the little bit I saw of it. And it wouldn't be till a few years later when I had my own job and PS1 games were in the bargain bin that I was finally able to own it. But that's the thing. I played Breath of Fire 2 for a week as a kid and never thought about it again. I saw someone play Breath of Fire 3 for like a half hour and it was always in the back of my mind like, dude, I gotta have this. Now, fun fact, I actually got Breath of Fire 4 before 3 because I didn't know what I was doing. But that's neither here nor there. So I won't be going in depth into 1 and 2. I don't enjoy them all that much, I don't think they've aged well, and I'm trying to keep my videos more positive. I said trying. I also won't be going into 5 or 6. 6 is a mobile-only game never released outside Japan, and 5 is... how do I put it? I think it's worse than 1 or 2, but it's at least fascinatingly bad. Like, I can at least enjoy the things it does really well and makes it stand out despite all of the horrible design choices. There's a lot you can say bad about 5, but it certainly isn't as boring as 1 and 2 are. But that's enough of a trip down memory lane, let's get into this game proper, starting with the plot. We begin the game innocently enough as a dragon encased in a stone material called Chrism. When we wake from our nap, we are understandably cranky and burn everyone alive until we get sucker punched by a crane. Shortly after, we meet Ray and Tipo, a pair of thieves who take us in. Eventually, we steal from someone who doesn't take it lying down and we get beat on by a pair of horsemen. Ryu starts traveling the roads in search of his foster family, and through a series of misadventures, we learn Ryu is a dragon, there was a big war a long time ago where the dragons were supposed to have been wiped out, and the whole looking for Rei and Tipo thing kind of falls off as the big pedo bear leading children through the world says we need to follow him into his creepy basement. You like popsicles? Well, sure. Then you need to come on down to the cellar. I got a whole freezer full of popsicles. Mm. In typical anime fashion, we get a time skip, we also reunite with Rei and the other characters, and the plot becomes all about reaching God to ask, what the hell? At this point, we get our own little odyssey, having to cross the ocean and a vast desert to wind up in a futuristic city. Along the way, we discover the other pedo bears besides Gar, get more information on the war with the dragons, and find out God may not be as benevolent as we've been led to believe. And obviously, I'm brushing past a lot of this, don't get me wrong, the plot is good, but it's not what keeps me coming back to the game. A split second is all it takes. That's why sooner or later you'll come crawling back to the zapper. So let's get into the characters now, starting with Ryu. As you'd probably expect, Ryu is the best character in the game, bar none. He's always with you, he has an opportunity to get almost all the available XP in the game, he gets really good heals, his stat spread lets him operate solidly as either a mage or a physical attacker, and to top it off, he gets the dragon forms. Hell, the dragon forms pretty much turn Ryu into about 15 other characters, and they're done so much better than the previous games. Breath of Fire 1, the dragons were ridiculously overpowered and killed the challenge of the game. 
Breath of Fire 2, the dragons felt like more trouble than they were worth unless your entire team's strategy was to spam them. 3 got it right. You pay mana to transform and there's a small cost to keep it going. The better the dragon form, the more mana it costs to keep. Not only that, but certain dragon forms can take up the place of the entire party. So if there's a boss that spams strong AoEs, then it might be a good idea to save the party and do as much damage as possible as a giant dragon. Ryu and the Dragon Gene system adds so much experimentation to the game that you'd think it was all that it had to offer as far as customizing characters, right? Hell no, but I'll dive into that particular system later. Nina is your mage. Now the problem with previous Breath of Fires is you could get Nina and a character named Deus. Deus was Nina but better in every way. There was never a reason to use Nina once you had Deus. So fortunately for Nina, there is no Deus this time around, at least not as a party member. Unfortunately though, if you're looking for magic damage, while base Ryu doesn't quite hit her numbers, his dragon forms do outclass hers. Granted though, you have to build Ryu as a mage to make that happen. Nina's other problem is her paper thin defenses. She's supposed to be the glass cannon of the group. Now there is a formation to boost her magic and almost all the formations can put her in a decently protected space with either higher defense or less likelihood to be attacked if your thing is mages and skirts. Me personally though, she's never in my endgame team. What is important is that you've got 30 seconds to tell me why you should keep your job. <coughs> well, I, uh... Yeah, that's not going to fly. Sorry, Halverstrom, you're fired. Momo is an odd one to talk about. She's kind of like Ryu in the sense her stat spread can be built to run either physical or magical damage, but she won't be the best at either. Her accuracy, for whatever reason, also sucks, and also, she can neither crit nor counterattack. Anytime I play the game, there's a master, and again, we'll talk about those later, that I feel is absolutely mandatory on Momo to fix her accuracy, as there are parts you require to use her, and I want her to at least be able to hit things. However, a really cool thing about Momo is her weapon equips. She can not only get elemental weaponry early on, but also gets guns that inflict sleep and other status effects. As far as basic attacks go, Momo is easily the most versatile, even if those bonus status effects have low odds to hit. But hey, it's the thought that counts. As an added bonus, her ultimate weapon in the game has the highest base damage stat. End of the day, though, she's not used unless I have to. She's always felt too RNG dependent for my taste, but my god, when luck is on your side, she's a monster. Ray is my favorite character in the game. He's got damage, he's got speed, a sick transformation, plus post time skip, he looks badass. The most awesome thing about Ray though is his speed. What you do with him is you get the chain formation. Stick Ray in the lead, level his speed, and your whole party becomes as fast as Ray. See, chain formation is kinda like Trick Room from Pokemon, the whole party speed is set to that of the leader, so you can get your slow tanks and bruisers to be able to attack first. But that's not the best part. There's a mechanic in the game where if you're fast enough, you get extra turns before the enemy. Level Ray's speed and I guarantee you will get extra turns all the way up to the final boss. Sure, chain formation cuts your defense in half, but you get those extra turns every turn so it doesn't matter. Trust me, you'll be able to survive one turn and worse comes to worse, someone gets to be the all-time healer on the extra turns. In my humble opinion, Ray with chain formation is the best strategy in the game. Now we come to the Pedo Bear Gar. Alright, I joke a lot, but Gar is a solid character. It's just funny how he's trying to bring children into his basement. Gar is your bruiser. High defensive stats and high space attack in the game. So if you've ever played an RPG before, you know what this is going to mean, right? His speed and magic sucks. But, as I was saying, this is why you have Ray in chain formation. Now you can have the highest attack in the game moving before the opponent can. And his base defenses are plenty enough to compensate for the defense loss of chain formation. Another really cool thing about Gar is his best weapon is obtained before you even cross the ocean. That's at about the three quarters part of the game. Think about that. For the last quarter of the game, just about, you're saving money on one of your character's equipment. That's awesome. Wow. Right? Yeah, Great. Thing. Amazing. Let's get a shoe shine. Finally, we have Pekko. This is the dark horse of the cast. At first glance, he looks absolutely terrible. I mean, he starts at level 1 when your cast should be in the double digits, so you'd have to grind him out to make him even half as useful as the other characters you've already been gearing for success. But see, that's where you're wrong. Originally, when I'd replay the game, I thought I had the genius idea of sticking Pekko under masters with good skills to learn. The idea was because he's such a low level, I can essentially make him the Breath of Fire equivalent of a Pokemon HM slave. But lo and behold, Pekko with levels is an absolute behemoth. For starters, he tanks hits arguably better than Gar. His astronomical HP stat feeds into his breath attacks, which all do damage based on his total HP value, so in short, big HP number, big damage number. He also makes a fine addition to a chain formation team comp, as same as Gar, his natural bulk offsets the defense drop. And let's not forget about his absurdly high counterattack rate. I think it's like 50% or something. My god, if Pekko just had better attack, I'd swear he'd be the best character in the game. Now, there's technically one more party member, but you only get him for like the first hour of the game, so we'll just ignore him. Okay, last major thing about the game I want to touch on is the incredible master system. Keeping up with the Pokemon references, the masters in the game are how you EV train your characters, if that makes any sense. So take Ryu and let's say we want to make him hit harder. We apprentice him to Bunyan. 
but whoops, that comes at a cost as reuse magic and mana will be stunted. That's the general idea. Masters tend to make one or two stats better at the cost of one or two others. They also teach unique skills, some of which are absolutely fantastic. But let's say you've got a character on a master for a particular skill, but it hurts that character's useful stats. No problem. Through an item called Skill Link, you can take skills you've learned by one character and transfer them to another. This is that Peko HM slave thing I briefly touched on earlier. But alas, all is not perfect with Breath of Fire 3. If the game had one glaring problem, it's definitely the forced minigames you run into. Some of them straight up don't work right and are performed contrary to the instructions given. Case in point, the well minigame. For whatever reason, this guy thinks it's a good idea to give us vinegar if we get him well water. The game tells you to hit a button to drop the bucket, wiggle it around, hit another button to bring it back up. I did this. Numerous times. Didn't work. To this day, I end up beating that stupid minigame by accident rather than design. It's frustrating. But I am able to power through it and get back to the parts of the game that I thoroughly enjoy. In my opinion, Breath of Fire 3 is easily in the top 5 games of the PlayStation 1. Hell, it's probably in top 3 of the PlayStation 1 RPGs. Yeah, but you know what? I will say this. I will say this. Give, given my, you know, my youthful experiences with the game, might have some rose tinted glasses on. I don't think that's the case. I think it's held up very well. It still looks beautiful, still looks gorgeous. The mini games suck, but, you know, every game back in the day had its problems like that. But anyway, all, all being said and done, I enjoy Breath of Fire 3. I think you'll enjoy Breath of Fire 3. I would highly recommend trying this game out.